Welcome to Book of Acts Now Global Church and School. We're continuing this morning our study on the Hebrew alphabet called the Aleph Tav. Uh, important building blocks to the Word of God. You see, each of these letters represents a concept in Hebrew or a word picture. And so when you're looking at a Hebrew word and you break it down to the individual letters and you take those word pictures and put them together, it tells us something about what the author had in mind in giving us that word. In other words, we need to step beyond English. We need to step back into the biblical mindset to see what God had in mind with the words he chose. So we're going to begin to do that today. And we're looking at the, uh, the Alatah, the Hebrew alphabet, the letter called Noon. Now, if you're not familiar with these, you can go to HebrewForChristians.com and there is a list of the Aleph Tav alphabet. And so then you're able to reference that as you're looking at these. And of course, uh, here at our setting, we actually have a handout on the alphabet people are referring to. So the first word that we're going to look at is the word for son. What does the Bible have in mind when it uses the word for son? It's made up of two letters, the bet. Um, and if you look on your handout, uh, the alphabet, what is bet? What's the word picture for bet? Well, the word picture for bet is house. Okay, and then we're going to look at um, this is noon. And you notice uh, normally noon has a foot on it down here. But when it's at the end, what we call the suffet ending, when it's at the end of the word, it drops that foot down and it lengthens it. And it doesn't have a foot. So that it changes form. There are several letters that do that. They change their form at the end of the word. And we see that here. So once you get used to that, you'll look at this and say, oh, okay, that's noon. Okay, and you see the little dot here on the B? That's called a dogesh. If the dot's there, it makes the B boy sound, B. If the dot is missing, it makes the V victory sound. But since the dot is there, uh, that tells us makes the B sound. And then you see the two little dots here underneath. That's the vowel. That's the E. And so if I'm looking at this word from right to left, we have B, E, N. And so this Hebrew word is pronounced Ben. Okay, so for example, if you were to say the son of David, you would say Ben David. That's how you say the son of David. Yeah, and you'll see that in the Bible when you're reading. And so what does it mean? Well, we know that this means house or family, and this means life. And so if you connect the concept son to that, the son is the life of the family. You look to the son to continue to carry the family and, and do the work and bring in, you know, when the father no longer can work, the son is there. He's bringing life to the family. And so that's the concept. Uh, whatever the Bible uses that. So now let's apply that to the Son of God, the Son of El. So is the Son of God life to the family? Yes, he is. Life to the whole world. And so if we, if we applied that, we, we could say Ben Yeshua, Son of God. All right, let's uh, read on to the next word. This is very interesting. The uh, word eagle, when it appears in the Bible, what is that all about? What does it mean? And so it's made up of three letters. The noon, you see the E represented. We see the shin, uh, and then we see E again, and then we see, what's this last letter here? Okay. Okay, so we look at these three letters, Ben, Shin. And what does shen mean on your alphabet? Shen means all-consuming fire. And then resh means the highest person. Sometimes that refers to Christ. Sometimes it just refers to the highest person of the house. So we put those three word pictures together. What does that have to do with eagle? One, if you take away the noon here and you just have those two letters, that is the word for prince. So the eagle has something to do with prince. And so if you put the noon, which means life, with the word picture for prince, the living prince. Isn't it interesting that America 
chose the symbol of the eagle to represent our nation. And I'm not, I'm not sure what our forefathers had in mind, but what it really says is because we're one nation under God, we're one nation under the prince, one nation under the living prince. The reason America is so blessed today is that we have aligned ourselves with God to say we are under him. And that's why we're blessed today. Now, there are some today politically that would like to remove God from every institution and, and not even use the name of God for anything. You know, when they go to court, they don't want you to swear in on the Bible anymore. If our country ever gets to the point where we deny him and we deny that we're one nation under God, this nation will go down. And so it's fitting that our nation chose the symbol of the eagle, whether they knew what they were doing or not, because the eagle means the living prince. And so when we use, you look on the dollar, we've got an eagle on there. And it says, one nation under God. What we're saying is, we're under the living prince. Wow. Next time you look um, at a coin that has that on that, you just go ahead and reconfirm the covenant of our fathers. Not a nation under God. We are under the living prince. And he is the prince of peace, and he's over our nation. And I declare that today. Whether it's politically correct or not, I agree with our forefathers. Hallelujah. Well, I'll get fired up on start preaching. Okay, the word for light is made up of these two letters, the noon and the resh. And we know the noon means life, and remember resh means highest person or person. Okay, so... <clears throat> In this case, light, life to the person or life to the head because that's where, that's where the person really resides is in your head. So when you get light, like from the Word of God, you're reading your Bible and you're receiving revelation, you're receiving light from God, that light is going to bring life to you. And that's why we need to read the Word of God, to be in the Word of God. Great to hear somebody preach, but we need to open our Bibles and we need to hear God talking to us and receive revelation. How many know that there? Are, these are technical terms or biblical terms, but illumination. Illumination happens when you're reading the Word of God. Revelation begins to take place where you can understand it. And illumination is where the Spirit illuminates that to your mind. And you go, oh, I get that. That's rhema. That's illumination. And we all need to do that. You say, well, come on now. That's just for scholars. I don't need that. Wait a minute. Christ Yeshua said this in, uh, in Luke chapter uh, 4, uh, beginning with that chapter. It says, Christ went into the wilderness and was tested for 40 days. Remember? And I think it's the verse 4 where it says, he said, uh, the devil tempted him. If you really are the Son of God, Turn that rock into bread and prove it. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. W-O-R-D in that instance is not logos. It's not head knowledge. In that instance, it is rhema, the Greek word rhema. And that word rhema means revealed truth from God. So what you're to live on daily is revealed truth from God that speaks to your heart and gives you manna. Amen? Now that's more than listen to a sermon. That's more than just taking, okay, I read the 23rd Psalms. I read it a hundred times. Yep, yep, he's a shepherd. No, 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 no. Rhema is when you read it and you feel a revelation or sense a revelation as God is speaking to you. And you realize he's not just a shepherd, he's my shepherd. Come on, that's rhema. And man shall live by every rhema that proceeds from the word of God. Amen? Okay, I like this. This is the word to lead. What does it mean to be a godly leader, a biblical leader? Well, we could find out by just breaking down the word and looking at the letters. So we have here uh, the noon, which means life. And here in the center we have hay. And if, if, you're, if you haven't heard us teach this before, whenever hay which means to, uh, to reveal or declare, whenever it appears 
in the middle of the word, it means God's heart. So this word to lead has something to do with God's heart if you're going to be a leader for him. And then it has, what's this letter here at the end? That's Lamed. And what's Lamed mean? Authority or the shepherd's staff. So now let's put those three word pictures together. Are you tracking with me? We've got life. We've got God's heart. We've got authority. Life of the heart is lifted up or seen in authority. So the idea is this. If you're a godly leader and you're, and you're serving God, your job is to lift up the heart of God and declare it with authority. Or you could say your job is to lift up the heart of God with the shepherd's staff, with the staff of the shepherd, so that when they see you, they see God's heart. I want you to think about that for a moment. All of us are called to be royal priests, kings and priests, part of the Melchizedek priesthood, royal priest, regents and priests. That means every believer, every believer is called to lead or to give revelation about God. And when we give revelation about God, it should always include the heart of God. Now, where we sometimes go astray on this is we get off uh, in Revelation, and I love the book of Revelation, but sometimes in, in some of the prophetic teachings, we focus so much on darkness and the mark of the beast and these things that we leave God out. And the book of Revelation says it is the revelation of who? It's the revelation of Yeshua, revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Well, if it's the revelation of him, no matter what you teach in that book or any other prophecy, it ought to point to Yeshua and to God's heart. And if it's not, then you're leading people off. You're not, what should I say? You're out of tune. It's like the old piano. If it's out of tune, it doesn't sound right. If, if you're not using the heart of God and what you're teaching, it doesn't sound right. You're out of tune. Does that make sense? Okay, I love this too. Rest. What does it mean to rest? Enter the God's rest. Very important concept. By the way, in Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about uh, this, uh, the Jewish people and following Moses. They didn't listen. They didn't enter his rest. And so they didn't get the blessing. And he says there remains a, a rest for today. There remains a Sabbath rest for today. And that we should not fault at entering his rest. Well, what does the word rest mean? We have again here noon. Now we have Vav. So look on your list, on your, uh, your alphabet. What does Vav mean? Attach or nail. And then we have Hey to declare, reveal. That's pronounced Nava. And you see there's a little T under each of these. That's, that's the vowel symbol for A. So you have na, va, because that has the V sound. And so what does that mean? Well, we have the life of the nail is revealed. Now, you know, we've got to pause and think about this. The life of the nail. Does the nail have life in it? No, it's pointing to life, because what did the nail do? The nail crucified the Savior. So the life of the nail is pointing to his sacrifice where he died for you and me and the price he paid and then the nail points to us and says keep your cross and follow me the nail points to us and says are you crucified with him Paul says I am crucified with him it is no longer I who live but he who lives in me the nail symbolizes all of those things and so if you've been to the cross if you have received him and, be and have been crucified with him where self is no longer on the throne of the heart but Christ is on the throne of your heart, you're going to enter into his rest. Be led by the Spirit, and you're going, to want, you're going to know what it means to have peace in your life and have rest in your life, the shalom of God. Isn't it amazing how out of three little letters you can get all of that? The life of the nail is declared. Well, he declared it 2,000 years ago on a cross. But guess what? 
is still being declared. He's wanting to declare it to you and me. And how often should we die according to what Paul says? I die how often? I die daily. In other words, he wants the nail to visit us daily. I'm crucified with Christ every day. What does that mean? I'm surrendering my will. I'm submitting myself to him. I'm every day because I submit myself to him and resist the devil, he has to flee and I get to walk in his rest. So it's not a one-time thing. You know, I was saved 20 years ago. Beautiful altar call. I responded to Christ and gave my life to him. Well, I hope you did that again this morning because we're to be crucified daily and enter into his rest daily. It's a surrender of the will takes place, a submission to God. And we're talk about this idea of sub, uh, submission and alignment with God uh, later in our sermon. But he wants us to do that. So what does that look like? Every day when I pray, I'm not focusing on what I did 20 years ago. Every day when I pray, I'm saying, Lord, I give you the throne of my heart today. I want you to rule and reign in my life. I surrender to you everything in my life, my finances, my relationships. Take self out of the way today and come and be king in my journey today. And when you do that, you keep walking in the rest, keep entering the rest. Amen. And the Holy Spirit will tell you what to do. You don't just need a checklist that you go by. What you need is a surrendered heart, and the Holy Spirit will direct you and guide you and what he wants you to do for today. All right, now this last one's good. This is interesting. The word for Mary. What does it mean to be married? Well, we have all kinds of definitions being given today. You know, we have same-sex marriage and, and uh, all kinds of redefining of what marriage is. Political correctness. But what does the Bible say marriage is? Let's take a look at what the word means. So I didn't write down the definition because you have to write it down for yourself. Amen? You make your own conclusion. So we have noon, which means life. And we have um, shin here, or in this case, it's, um, it, it's pronounced S because the dot's on the left side instead of the right side. Okay, so we have uh, N-A-S-A, -A, and this is silent on the end because Aleph has no sound unless you put something with it, a valve with it. So this is pronounced Nasa. So this is the Hebrew word for Mary, to marry. And so life, the consuming fire of the Father. So I want you to think about this. Who created marriage to begin with? It's an institution. In fact, it's a covenant. It's one of the two covenants that we find at creation that God gave. And so with this particular covenant that God gave, God says it's between a man and a woman. I remember the, the uh, description in the book of Genesis. A man shall leave his family and, uh, and be joined to his wife. And the two be, shall become one flesh. And so it's the miracle of God that makes that one flesh happen. It's his covenant, his definition, but also his miracle. That two people who are separate beings can become one together. That's the miracle of God. And God says it happens because his fire is involved. The fire of the Father. He is an all-consuming fire. So when you come before the altar of God, the all-consuming fire of God recognizes your covenant, and his consuming fire causes you to be melded together into one flesh. And that blessing only comes upon the relationship that fulfills what God describes as a marriage. And so you could be married by the laws of the land. Many people are. Just go to the justice of the peace. But you're not really married in God's eyes unless you come into a covenant with him. Because guess what? It's not a partnership between two people. It's a partnership between two people and God himself. 
And when he's a part of the partnership, then you get the miracle of the oneness. There are a lot of people walking around married on paper with the government, but they're not married in heaven because they don't have the covenant with God. And so instead of having the blessing of God, you have what man manufactures. And why does that matter? Well, listen, when you're one with God, you're capable of having love that goes beyond what man or a woman can give. Because the source of all love is God. And so when God is in the midst of the relationship, you're going to have a greater capacity to love without selfishness. A greater capacity to give and to cherish and to honor. Because that's how he is. And so you begin to see that put on display in the relationship. And the ultimate purpose of the marriage, according to Ephesians chapter 5, is for us to see Yeshua the bridegroom, and his bride. And so the marriage between a husband and wife is to depict the marriage between Yeshua, Christ, and his church. It's a mystery, Paul says. And in that mystery, we begin to learn and understand what it is that Yeshua wants to have with each one of us because we're married to him. You know, in Israel, you can buy rings that have Hebrew writings on them. And Margie is wearing one of them. And it says, I am, it's quoting the Proverbs, and it says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And uh, so when she put that on, what she was saying is, I'm married to Christ. I'm married to Yeshua. He is my beloved and I'm his beloved. That's what he wants for each one of us. Amen. So, when you begin to pervert that and change it, you also pervert the understanding of the union that even the Savior wants to have with me. Amen? So we need to, we, in our society, we need to go back to biblical foundations. And we need to understand what God meant and said and why. So that we can be walking in the blessings that God has. Amen? So I hope that you'll look at these things during the week. Uh, those of you who have been writing these down and taking notes. And uh, when you look at what it means to have life, you're looking at what it means to have life in God. And how does he define life? And what does it mean to experience life? The life that God gives. Well, you know, all religions lead to the same place. There are some people who say, and it doesn't matter who you follow, because it'll all take you to the same place. I'm sorry, but that's not biblical. You know, the devil said in the Garden of Eden, uh, if you disobey God and eat that fruit, you will not surely die. You'll become like a God yourself and just be self-actualized. There are people walking around today teaching psychology that says, uh, in order to be fulfilled, you need to be self-actualized. It's the same lie. And you'll realize that you're really your own Savior. No, there's only one Savior who died on a cross and rose again. And there are not many paths to God. And you know, some of those paths that they cite, whether it's a, a Buddha or Confucius or whoever, they're dead. But the one who died and rose again, he's alive forever. And he's the one who says, come unto me. All you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, God wants us to come back to biblical foundation and not in rationalism, not in spiritualism, not in all of the things that men teach in order to keep from being surrendered to the God of the universe who created all things. You have to come back to him to have true life. Amen. So, Father, we ask that you bless us as we apply what we learned today, these biblical foundations. And, Lord, we ask that you'll give us life and teach us what life looks like and how to enter your rest and how to abide in you. For when we abide in you, we will know life. Thank you now for blessing us as we walk out the things that we're learning from the Word of God. I pray for Rhema that you'll quicken each of us to personally hear from you. And that manna will sustain us 
I pray these things in the name of Christ Yeshua. Amen.